many of you know that Nancy and I not only publish Big Blend Radio and TV magazine and Parks and Travel magazine, both digital publications, uh, we also travel full-time when there's no quarantine going on. Uh, we travel full-time on our Love Your Parks tour where we're documenting all types of parks, from community parks to national parks uh, across America. And while we're doing that, we're also gathering stories about the people and the communities. And uh, so a lot of our friends and partners have assigned us to these story missions, which have also become map projects that we've done, interactive maps. You can see all of this at nationalparktraveling.com. But our first guest today is Glenn Burrows, and he sent us on a mission to connect England with America. And Glenn is a family historian. He's a historian. He, he knows everything about English history. And he is also the owner of Norfolk Tours in England and also uh, the owner of Visit Breckland. So this is all in East Anglia area. Uh, he takes people out to uh, actually experience family their family history. Uh, so if you've got relatives and ancestors from England, he can take you around when you know the quarantine's lifted and everything's clean and fine, and take you around, but also help you virtually uh, if you're out there looking at you know you know trying to find transcripts or sources uh, from your family history. He can help you with that. So anyway, go to norfolk-tours.co.uk to connect with him. But he sent us on that mission to find family history and uh, that connects back to England. And we also have our friends over at Books Forward, the uh, amazing publicity team for publishers and authors. Uh, they sent us on a mission to find literary stories. So Nancy, remember back in summer uh, last year when we were in Colorado? Yeah. We went to Colorado Springs area, went mm -hmm. to the Garden of the Gods, and then we found this park by accident. It's called North Cheyenne Canyon Park. It's a canyon park, actually. It's in a deep canyon. Remember that mountain pass. And uh, it's beautiful. It's a 1,600-acre park, and it's known for hiking and biking and picnicking and bird and wildlife watching, which we did just a little bit of all of that except for bicycling. You don't want to see that. But we found... Helen Hunt Falls. Helen Hunt Jackson is a famous author who wrote the best-selling book Ramona um, and other stories. She's a poet and Native American uh, rights activist. And even the community we used to live near, Ramona, in Southern California, uh, it ties back to her, and she's got historic sites named after her. But these waterfalls were named, it's, it's like a 35-foot uh, waterfall, it was named in her honor. She was buried uh, just up the road from there and uh, died um, in, in San Francisco, but buried in Colorado Springs. So this brings us to Glenn. So, Glenn, how are you doing? That's a long introduction, but, you know, there's that story behind it all. So welcome back. Well, I, so, well thank you, but what a fantastic um, story. And it's um, it's, it's lovely to, to chat to you, and uh, I know you're all uh, holed up in your little place, and I'm holed up in my little place, so, um, you know. <laughs> It's it's good that we can that we can still chat to each other. Oh, absolutely! I think you know, and we, we our friend Jerry here, who has the homestead in in Twenty Nine Palms. I'm like, whoa, everything's working here. Internet, phones, we can do our daily shows again. We can go live. She's like, yes, do it. You know, so we really got to give a shout out of thank you to her to let us, uh, you know, kind of take over some of her rooms here at the inn. Uh, to Indeed. do this, but Glinda's connection is really amazing, and you know, even before we got on the air, we were talking about Hazel Spell, who homesteaded the property we're on. Uh, she could possibly come from uh, your neighborhood, and in fact, Helen Hunt Jackson, <laughs> they even do a whole, uh, like a, a, a this whole play reenactment uh, pageant called Ramona uh, in Southern California in the town of Hemet that she wrote the book on, and so a lot of these areas, Nancy and I have been through, and we just didn't make all these connections. Um, they do this every year in, in her honor. Um, but we didn't know, like, not only does she come from England, but really your backyard, literally. Yeah, I mean, that was, it was quite funny. When when you first of all um, gave me her name, I mean, Helen Hunt Jackson doesn't really give me much at all. But as soon as you said that her maiden name was Fisk, it immediately gave my head a little buzz as if I'd had an electric shock put through it because Fisk is an East Anglian name. Fisk is almost always from Norfolk and Suffolk. Every, oh, wow. you know, every, every name, um, every unusual name especially, can very often be taken back to a specific area. And, and Fisk 
is definitely one of those that immediately you think about Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, it's it's amazing. I mean, my my great great grandmother was a, a Benefer, and the name Benefer is only found in Kings Lynn. Oh wow! So if okay. if anybody knows anybody called Benefer, it's almost certain that they originate from Kings Lynn in Norfolk. You know, so very often you'll find a name will have a location, you know, connected to it. And Fisk, Fisk is one of them. So as soon as you said Helen Hunt Jackson was originally a Fisk, I thought, well, she must have a Norfolk connection. Wow. And um, funnily enough, she does. Wow, cool. So this, uh, this all starts from a waterfall. You know, <laughs> but it is yeah, funny. Eh? Exactly. It's funny because we lived in Julian in the mountains in San Diego, California, um, for a, a few years. And um, the town below is Ramona and Hemet, just around the corner. All of this was connected to uh, Native American history, and, and her story is connected with it. And what's interesting, too, Glenn, you know how we have this thing, especially I do, the Juan Batista the Anza expedition that went from Mexico through southern Arizona and up through California to, to uh, was actually how they founded the Presidio. Uh, New Spain founded the Presidio and created mm -hmm. San, what we know San Francisco today. She was connected in all these different places. Uh, she, remote, Hemet is definitely part of that uh, expedition and now which is part of a historical trail. And she also, to write her book Ramona, went to a town called San Juan Batista that we, uh, you know, love to hang out. And I know you've met Jim Ostick on the air. who He lives up there. Yes. And apparently yes. she went there to write. She was looking for a retreat to write this book. And I did mm -hmm. all this digging up, and I don't know what's true, what's not. But scandal is uh -oh. that the – now, Nancy, you and I, there was a house there, and it's the Bean Residency, the Bean Residency. And she wanted to rent a room, and there was a woman in there – and she has uh, her kids, and the woman uh, is quite a feisty Irish woman, apparently, and one of the kids were naughty with the molasses or something, and molasses went flying, and basically some harsh words were spoken, and so Helen Hunt Jackson told the woman where to go, <laughs> where to get off, and left, and didn't go and settle there, and that's how she ended up in Hemet area and Ramona to write the book Ramona. Isn't that crazy? So wow. I don't know it's, something. She didn't want to be a some, some ratty things, kids. <laughs> some things, some things just happen, don't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's so we live near it, and now and and so do you. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of. Well, yeah, yeah. these these connections just keep coming up. You know, it's 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 quite quite amazing when when you actually start to dig into these things. I mean, although Helen Hunt Jackson's early family didn't actually come um, from from Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, but they well, they came from Norfolk and Suffolk. But what I'm saying is that they went to America really early. They were in America in the early 1600s, you know. So it, her family was, was American, you know. She, she was American. But the, the connection goes right back to the, to the 1630s which, wow. you know, is a very early immigrant family. You know, they came over at the time of the uh, of the religious problems, you know, when there was a lot of uh, a lot of people in who didn't have beliefs like everybody else and the persecution of, of different religious sects were were quite rife. So a lot of people decided to up sticks from England and go to America. And the the Fisk family was actually one of them. They left, they left Suffolk, um, and went across to America. They uh, they were in Salem. They were in uh, Wenham, um, and they were in that sort of area of um, Massachusetts. And when you when you have a look at place names, um, there's the the Wenham in Massachusetts, but actually there's a a village called Wenham just outside Ipswich in in Suffolk. So it's quite likely that the early settlers from that area of Suffolk called their new settlement after their old settlement. Now, the same as we've already discussed about Abraham Lincoln's ancestors 
who went from Hingham in Norfolk to Hingham in Massachusetts. You know, so you see that so often that people who left England would call their new settlement after the village they came from, which, you know, home from home, isn't it, you know? So So that's a clue for us, like when we're doing our family history, to look at the town names. It it can be. It can be, definitely. Because if you look over the, the east coast of America, so many places... Um, are named after English place names. And there's a lot of them that are named after Norfolk and Suffolk places. Um, you know, I, I look at a map of the east coast of America and, you know, so many of the towns and, and villages and settlements are, are names that I recognise. I think mm-hmm. I probably told you, I was doing some research um, for a lady whose ancestors actually went over from Hingham to Hingham and I was looking at a book, and it kept saying about Norfolk and Suffolk and Ipswich, and then suddenly I realised that actually they were talking about America. They weren't talking about England because all of those place names are in America. So they were travelling from Norfolk and Suffolk and Ipswich, which are all place names. Wow. But obviously these people who went over to America called their new settlements Norfolk, Suffolk, Ipswich, Hingham, Wenham, Wyndham, you know, lots and lots of places are all all over there as well. It's, it's quite oh, amazing. Wyndham. That's interesting. I know a Wyndham family. That's, yeah, Wyndham is, a, is, a, is also a, a, a well-known landed gentry family, but that's spelled W-I-N-D-H-A-M. Yeah. Um, the, the place name... Is actually spelled Wymundham, which is W Y M O N D H A M, and that is a place in Norfolk called Wyndham, even though it's spelled Wymundham. And there are places in America called Wyndham spelled the same. So obviously, these people who went to America from Wyndham called their new settlement Wyndham and spelled it the same, which is quite funny. I think maybe they just wanted to feel like they were back at home. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, you know, and mm-hmm. things things that are, are familiar, you know, just give you mm-hmm. that little bit of, of sort of support mentally, doesn't it, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that comfort. So it's think, kind of like, yeah. yeah. And also maybe honoring family, you know. Um, so a lot of, like we've talked before, especially with the Mayflowers, um, was, you know, really – folks fleeing England to come over here because of religious persecution. And so it yes. seems that that was also the case for Helen Hunt's ancestors. Yes. Oh, yeah, that was definitely definitely why um, the Reverend John Fisk, um, he went over from from uh, Suffolk uh, and went across. Um, he, was, he obviously was um, quite well educated because he was a, he was a, a clergyman, um, and he taught in Salem. Uh, in a, a college or a school in Salem um, before moving to to Wenham. Um, and he was there by the 1640s. Um, but um, for Helen, Helen Hunt's, Jackson's um, relatives, they were, all, they were all connected to the same families. You know, the, it seems that there was quite an extended family who went over from Suffolk to, uh, to Massachusetts at the same time. Wow! Wow! And so you send us photos of these churches from South, uh, yes. from Suffolk, and um, it's funny, funny because I would like go. Oh, Suffolk is like the southern part, and Norfolk is the northern part <laughs> yes, of the folk. That's right, right? It, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, oh, okay, not bad. Um, but it. So when I was looking at that, I'm like, well, this is interesting. So you know, their family literally could go to these churches. Their American family. They did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 any relations of the Fisk family who are related to um, Helen Hunt Jackson's family, um, they de- they really need to come across to this area of, of Suffolk and and some parts of Norfolk, obviously, um, to see where their ancestors were. I mean, the the interesting area um, where the family were living. I mean, um, John, the Reverend John Fisk was baptised in South Elmham, St. James. And the area of South Elmham 
is is quite amazing because the, that area is actually just called the Saints because there are I think there are fifteen fifteen churches all within the same area that wow. were all either South Elmham or Ilkenshaw. So you have you have lots of places that are definitely um, within the same sort of parishes. No, sorry, there was 13, not 15, 13. Um, so you've got like um, Ilkchall St Andrews, Ilkchall St John, Ilkchall St Lawrence and Ilkchall St Margaret. So all of those villages are all together and they are all Ilkchall. And then you've got South Elmham and there were eight villages of South Elmham. So you've got All Saints, St. George, St. James, St. Margaret, St. Mary, St. Michael, St. Nicholas, and St. Peter. And all of those were South Elmham. So very often you'll, you'll hear, especially a local from that area, they will say that they live in the Saints. They don't live in Ilkenshaw or they don't live in South Elmham. They will just say they live in the Saints because there's 13 villages that are all known by their saints' name of their church, so that's they, that's quite quite fascinating. Are they very close to each other? Oh yeah, they're all within the same area. Um, if you look at if you look at a map, um, you'll see that Ilkshaw and South Elmham are right beside each other. So these these all these churches are in a very very small area, and they're, they're all to a different saint, you know. So that's why the area is called the Saints, because one of my one of my ancestors actually came from that area, and he moved to to Norfolk. He was born in 1811, and then he moved to Norfolk. And when he uh, had to say where he was born, he just put Saint Cross because one of the churches was St. George's and they called it St. Cross as a, a, a local name. Um, and I thought, well, where is this mm. village called St. Cross? Because I didn't know at the time. Uh, and it turned out that um, he actually came from South Elmham St. Cross, which is um, another one of the mm. South, South Elmham villages, you know. Wow. Mm. Amazing. Oh, wow. And this, this Freestone family you're talking about, Yes. Does that go? You know, you think about. You always talk about looking at the names, also that it goes according to their craft or their expertise or their job. Now, freestone is that going to be part of like a free ma- kind of Freemason, or is it going to be like yours in stonework? <laughs> you know. Um, well, it could be that he was he was a stonemason, um, but it could also be that he came from a village in Suffolk, which was called Friston. Oh. So it could be that the name originated from the village of Friston because Freestone and Friston are very, very similar when you say them out loud. So it's hmm. it's debatable. It's very, very debatable where that name originated from. But the Freestone family, the, the man who, who was born in 1811 and then moved up to Norfolk, it's actually his ancestors that were living in South Elmham um, at the same time as Helen Hunt Jackson's ancestors were living in South Elmham. So the the thing that has sort of made the hair on the back of my neck stand up is the fact that my ancestors would have known Helen Hunt Jackson's ancestors because they would have went to the same churches at the same time. So, and it wasn't like thousands of people in one little village. No, no, no. These these places are tiny villages. So, you know, wow. they would have they would have known each other because they wow. they were in the same churches at the same time, baptizing children, getting married and being buried. So they would have known each other. And that to me is what family history is all about. It's about yeah. what people were doing and and how they were living. And the thought that, you know, all right, Helen Hunt Jackson's family went over to America in the 1640s. My my own family, the Freestones, 
still stayed in the South Elmham area, but you know the the fact that they the families knew each other is a real real connection. And it, wow. All right. So it's so it's you know four hundred years ago, but it's it's still pretty amazing when That's... you actually think that four hundred years ago my ancestors and Helen Hunt Jackson's ancestors were rubbing shoulders with each other, you know. Very and we cool. <laughs> set foot in all these places where she was and where she wrote mm-hmm. and what she wrote about. She was an amazing woman. When you think about women in history, and, you know, I know we were talking about this before we went live, about their strength. I mean, the the yes. homestead that we're in now, it's a, it's a bed and breakfast inn. It's no longer operating as an inn, but um, all the different uh, pieces of property here are, are uh, long-term rentals for the military because we're at the you know the largest marine base in the world is here, and so we've got lots of young men running around. <laughs> not okay. complaining. I'm not complaining. Okay. It's it's a beautiful day in the in desert. Uniform. I'm just saying. <laughs> but H- Hazel Spell, who came out here, she came out on her own with her kids, and homesteaded this land, and the acreage really goes out. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Jerry was showing me just how far this goes out. It's pretty incredible. With and she was also a writer. And I think the women did a lot by the power of the pen. And some of the places we've been, like Cammie Henry um, in, in Kasachi National Forest, she, that she basically helped put the forest on the map. All these women yeah. homesteading, I know we're going to be chatting about this on Wednesday's show. We're having a special tribute to women because it is the year of the woman, 2020. And one lady in, in, in Colorado went on the prairies, and this is what we're finding. All these old homesteads, and ranches, a lot of time, were run by women on their own or their sisters together. Like it just, or the men were off fighting in a war. The women were yes. like out on the prairie, in the middle of Indian wars, all kinds of things, right? And this woman, Rattlesnake Kate, she got attacked on horseback trying to get to her kids on the ranch because she was ranching on her own. All these rattlesnakes attacked her, and she killed right. every single one of them, skinned them, and made a dress out of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, as you do, yeah, you know, dude. No way, I'd be running for the hills. I Forget would not the kids. Mess with her. <laughs> okay. You do not mess. You with don't her. mess with them, and you know. So it's really interesting when you dig into history and, and the power of the pen. One thing I wanted to touch on this is I know that a lot of famous writers come from Norfolk. You know, we've talked about that Beatrix Potter and Anne Sewell. Um, one lady that I find interesting is that. Helen Hunt Jackson went to school with Emily Dickinson, and right. this is when they were in Amherst. So, Emily Dickinson, any roots back to your land too? <laughs> well, um, Dickinson, Dickinson is a definitely a name that um, is is a Norfolk name as well. Mm. Um, so I will look her up. Oh, I mean, yeah. you never you never know. Because um, you know Dickerson is a name that I I recognise in Norfolk, but um, um, you were just saying about um, women writers. I mean Beatrix Potter came from the Lake District, which yeah. obviously isn't too far from Norfolk compared to um, America, but it's uh, it's a little distant from Norfolk. But um, I, I, when you were saying about um, women being strong and sort of changing the world, I mean it's, it's exactly what Anna Sewell did because she realized that horses were being badly treated. And actually, it's thanks to Anna Sewell that the RSPCA was founded. Um, well, it, it, it was already in existence, but it really became a big thing thanks to Anna Sewell, because the whole reason for her book was to give the horses view of what was going on. Mm-hmm. And she basically stopped the use of one of the cruel bits that they mm. used to use for horses. Yeah. Um, so actually, you know, she did her bit, even though she was um, she was crippled. You know, when she wrote that book, she was she was crippled. She could hardly walk. So this is why she she was so close to horses because horses helped her to get about. But you know, women really did keep the things going. You know, because. The men are out on the land doing the gardening or, or the, you know, the farming or fighting the wars, but it's the women who are at the back doing everything that keeps everything ticking over. And, mm. you know, I know I know we keep hearing about, you know, 
National Women's Day and all this, that and the other. But but actually, women are not actually um, recognised for the big part that they played in history in general. Because if it weren't for them looking after the household, you know, the men wouldn't be able to go out and do stuff. Mm. Mm -hmm. Also, looking after a household today is not the same as back then. I mean, we don't have to make (laughs) our own soap, you know. We don't have to make our own candles. There was so much that a woman had to do back then that we don't have to do today that now, you know, it's like, oh, we can watch TV during the day. Well, I don't think you'd find a woman, (laughs) you know, (laughs) hundreds of years ago looking at TV instead of, like, hand-washing down at the creek making candles, you know, all sorts of things yeah. like that. Yeah. And it, shooting it was, squirrels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's all about history um, and all about general history as well as family history because um, I, often, I often say that, you know, all right, so family history is one of my passions, but I have to put everything into context because – it's no good just learning the names and the dates of people. It's all about how they lived, where they mm-hmm. lived, what yeah. they did for a living, you know, how, how, they, how they managed. You know, the thought of Helen Hunt Jackson's ancestors going over to America in the 1630s in a boat that was probably about as big as a, as a school bus, you know, going across mm-hmm. the Atlantic in a boat the size of a school bus, Mm. Um, it is just beyond com- yeah. comprehension. Yeah. You know, they're coming from a from a land where they know what they're facing, and they go into something that they've got no idea what they're going to mm-hmm. face. Yeah. You know, the guts that took. Mm-hmm. You know, can you imagine? Can you imagine even today getting on a boat the size of a school bus in England? No. And sailing to America, even though you know what you're going to end up in, you're going to turn up and, you know, there's going to be a a ticker tape uh, reception for you and this, that and the other. But in the 1630s, they didn't have a clue what was going to happen when they got to the other end. And so so many of them either, well, they either died on the voyage or some of them died Mm -hmm. as soon as they arrived because of the diseases that were over there. Um, And also starvation they couldn't just go to the shop and, and buy tools. You know, they had to make them. You know, they, they couldn't go to the shop and, and buy pasta and toilet rolls, which everyone seems to have been doing lately. They, they had to go and grow it. <laughs> well, you, know. you know, it's kind of interesting with this whole virus thing because it, it changes so many things on so many levels, on a global level. And we were talking about this with an interview with a scientist yesterday we were recording and, we're saying, you know, in a way, this shows how we really do live in a fishbowl. We are really all connected. Family mm. history proves this all the time, and these conversations yeah. just prove it even further. But this kind of virus thing, you've got to kind of, in a way, it allows us to understand what it was like for our ancestors in the times of a plague, in the times of, hey, now you've got to get on a boat because, you know, all hell's coming down. <laughs> you know, they don't like your religion, and you strongly believe it. I mean, the, the survivalism, the survivalist skills that they had back then to what we have now, now we have to kind of muster their strength. I think family history is, is really important now more than anything to kind of realize the, the strength our ancestors had um, more, mm. for a lot of us and, well, and to carry through now. It gives us that little bit I, of, hey, they did it, so can we, you know? Yeah, but I mean the the thing is we are so useless today. Um, I was I was lost. Are you I talking was, about was, politics again? No, no, please don't, please don't. Okay. Um, okay. I, I was I was talking to Diane the other day and I said all we need now is a power cut. You know, if they turned the electricity off, we would be completely stuck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely yeah. and utterly stuck. We've, we we wouldn't survive a week. Without or electricity, water. electricity well, and yeah, water. Well, yeah, that as well. We're in the desert. But you know, just, <laughs> just, just think, just think what it was like for those people who stepped off the boat in 1635, for instance, 
in in America, they had to start from scratch. You know, they they obviously could take stuff with them, but not very much. So if they were sensible, they'd probably take a saw, some knives, a couple of cooking pots, you know, some grain. But you know, they couldn't take much with them, and they had to start from scratch. I mean, today all we need to do is go to the supermarket, and everything is there. You know, we turn on a light, and the light is there. We haven't got to worry about anything. You know, so this this has probably made people sit up and think, but I don't think a lot of people will sit up and think for very long. I think it'll yeah. just go back to normal after this is all over and done with. You know, mm-hmm. we've we've been we've been in situations before where people say, Oh well I hope this makes everything different. It won't. People yeah. will go back to, to how they were. They'll soon forget about this. Well, I hope we all get back to some kind of normalcy soon. You know, I do want to, I do want to touch on this. You, I mean, we're all in the tourism world. Um, Just in closing here, that um, with Norfolk Tours, obviously a lot of things are canceled this year of people traveling, and you know, a lot of our partners and friends are travel writers as we are. I mean, we don't know what's going to be open when, what hotels are open. You know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's kind of this unknown, but you have to keep, you know, keep foot forward. Are you able to work with people? Because a lot of people have got that now. Now's their you know open time to you know work on family history because they're all sitting in you know we're all shut-ins now, and yes. so this is an, a perfect opportunity to dig into that project that you you know may not have always had time for because of work and things. But are you able to work with people virtually to help them with their British ancestry? Oh, definitely. Um, this has been an absolute perfect time for them to plan for next year, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, things will be back to normal. Um, you know, it's going to take some time. But now is the time to plan. Now is the time to, to actually get online and see what you can find about your ancestors, you know. It doesn't doesn't take very long to, to get a start, you know. And um, I'm always here to help. At the moment, I can't get out and do very much. So I'm, I'm around to... Uh, to help, all someone's got to do is drop me an email, and I'll be more than help, happy to to help them to make a start. And I, as I was saying to you earlier, I'm I'm actually thinking about doing some some little videos of uh, you know how to start doing your family history. But uh, I need to get the courage to stand in front of a to stand in front of a camera and actually do it. So <laughs> watch this space. Yeah, I, lo- I love that. I know because it's yeah it's. That's why we do radio, Glenn. It's so much easier. We can be in pajamas <laughs> in a hotel room, you know. It's like, yeah, yeah, quite. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it is easier. But I think that's really great. Um, there's so many tools to communicate now with Skype and Zoom and Facebook, and yeah. um, we yeah. really have those tools to stay connected. You know, somebody was saying it shouldn't it shouldn't be it should be physical distancing, not social distancing. One thing I have oh, seen definitely. is more connectivity having happening. People are actually picking up the phone and chatting with yep. a friend, a long lost friend and you know, doing things like that. So um I think it's really can I, can I just, positive. Can I can I just say here, um, as somebody who suffers with, with mental health problems, it is really, really important to not be socially distant with people. Yeah. You know, isolation is okay physically, but isolation is not okay mentally. So yeah. Please, please do pick up the phone, do talk to people, you know, do keep in touch with other people. Because for for me, I know isolation is deadly. You know, mm. I I really do not do isolation very well. So I know for a fact that other people with mental health problems probably have the same problem. So now is the time to pick up the phone and, and talk to people. You know, that really is so, so important. So, I mean, family history and, and everything apart, do keep in touch with other people. I love that. It's so mm-hmm. true. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it is. It, we have the tools, you know, and, and cost-effective ones as well. So Yeah, the yeah. really house is quicker that way. And, and really, sometimes just be the, the person to pick up the phone and call your friends, you know, especially if you know, hey, they could use a call now. Grandma needs a call. Granddad needs a call. Uncles, aunts. 
everybody, uh, just connect yeah. and play board games or, you know, but disinfect them first. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> uh, talking, know, talking about, talk, talking about grandma and granddads. Um, I will just, I will just give a, a plug, even though my parents are not listening because they don't have the internet. But today is my parents' 65th wedding anniversary. Oh wow! So I thought cool. um, I would just make a mention of that. So I took their shopping over to them yesterday and left it on the doorstep, and spoke to them through the kitchen window because obviously they are in the um, in the age group that they mustn't mix with anybody. So um, yeah, that's their 65th wedding anniversary today. So I I think that's something special. Wow. Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, awesome. cheers to them. I, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful, Glenn. So it's, uh, you know, a toast for 65 years. I, I don't think I know anybody who's been married for 65 <laughs> years. Wow, that's pretty incredible. That is that incredible. Is. You do know. Please, please give them a shout out and, and a that hug. Could well, be a, like a world record. A virtual hug from Nancy. No, and I, no, no, you know? no. It's not. It's not a world record. The the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were married in 1947, so they've been oh, married wow. for 73 years, I think it is. Wow! Wow, that's amazing. Or it will be. Yeah, wow. 1947 they were married, I think. Wow! I, I don't think that happens in America. <laughs> no, not not as often. Well, I don't know. The world's kind of changing, and you know, people are living longer too. So there it is. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Exactly. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real treat. And um, we're, I know the Helen Hunt uh, Jackson story will just continue because as we travel mm-hmm. more, we'll find out more. And uh, everyone, again, keep up with Glenn at norfolk-tours.co.uk. Um, in a couple of days, you'll be able to see his article and some of the photos of the churches, um, also where her family went to church and uh, also we'll be featuring it in the upcoming issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine. I think we'll call it the quarantine issue. You know? oh, nice. <laughs> I know. I right? so. All right. You take care, Glenn. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks girls. Look after yourselves. Right. Bye-bye. You take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.